Good evening. Among this year's anniversaries, as I'm sure most of you already know, most noteworthy is the anniversary of the Magna Carta signed on the 28th of May 1215. It is a document that has acquired the characteristics, the characteristics, characteristics and the power of myth. As we will see, or perhaps maybe you already know, it was but a unilateral unilateral concession by the king, King John, to solve a temporary crisis that managed for a moment to unify the feudal lords of England, but the Magna Carta lasted less than two months. Most of these clauses deal with specific and often, often long-standing grievances rather than in general, with general principles of law. Some of the grievances are clear Others can only be understood in the context of a feudal society in which they arose, and the precise, the precise meaning of, a few of this clause is still uncertain. Anyway, the Magna Carta was declared null, null and void, by Pope Innocent III and by King John on August 24th of the same year, 1215, once the king was able to establish as we would say, law and order within the ranks of his unruly feudal vassals. Later, the text of the Magna Carta was restructured and reformulated by King son, John's son, Henry III. And in this reformulation, the term parliament became a judicial, a judicial assembly of sort under the complete control of regal functionaries. Even so, we cannot extinguish the wonder encapsulated, for example, in Proposition 39, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land which, you may agree, exceeds in scope the spirit and the practice, for example, of the so-called Patriot Act, recently and Orwellianly renamed Freedom Act. Without even thinking or considering the killing list, which the most Christian president of this country signs weekly, killings to be executed by the operators of the push buttons of death, comfortably seated at a video game console in some air-conditioned killing arcade, maybe in, in Nevada or elsewhere. But let's go in order. As usual, things are more intricate than they may seem at the onset. The antecedents of the Magna Carta go back to the time before 1066, when England was under the rule of the Anglo-Saxon kings. The arrangement was very similar to what happened in France with the Carolingian kings, whose best known exponent was, of course, Charlemagne. The Anglo Saxon kings assigned to the large landowners, landowners the responsibility for the military management of the lands that they controlled, which were called earldoms. For all functions other than military, the kingdom was subdivided into shires, controlled by agent or agents of the crown were called sheriffs, which is a rearrangement of the word shire or reeve, or if you like, country supervisor of sorts. After the very well-known Battle of Hastings in 1066, William of Normandy wanted to strengthen the organizational, the organizational unity of England, and he eliminated the structure of the earldoms, assigning to the, his vassals smaller territories, often, often fortified the fortification being called manors, but keeping various castles under the direct, the direct control of the crown. Being by nature suspicious, William saw to it that the famous doomsday be put together. And the doomsday is an accurate, as you know, calculation of all the assets of the kingdom, and its objective, its objective was to facilitate tax assessment and collection. The doomsday book showed what was already known namely that the king was the largest owner of land in England and as such as a such he expected an oath 
of allegiance from the vassals, and still he was allowed to exact more tributes. For example, when the vassals assured their lands, sales tax if you like, or wanted exemption from the military service. The organization was not simple and required various functions centered around the figure of the king. So we have the chancellor, who was responsible for the chancery, the arm of the royal government dealing with domestic and foreign affairs. And usually, usually, the, the person filling this office was a bishop chosen, chosen for, his, for his knowledge of the law. He was called the justiciar, and he was the head of the royal judicial system and also the king's viceroy when the king and the actual viceroy were both absent from the country. Then there was the treasurer who was responsible to quantify, to measure and to keep account of the taxes paid by the vassals. And this accounting was done in the court, in the court of the exchequer, so-called exchequer, because on the table used at these maxi accounting meetings, they spread the checker mantle on the table to facilitate the accounting. The Chancellor of the Exchequer was a function established in 1129 by King Henry I. And by the way, the word Chancellor derives from the Latin word Cancellarius, Keeper of the Barriers, Secretary, Usher of the Law of Court, so called because he worked behind the lattice or gate, which is Latin is Cancellus, at a basilica or law court as it was called. A further development occurred when King Henry II, John's father, with the so-called Assizes of Clarendon in 1166, where it was essentially declared and established that the king or the crown was the arbiter of all legal issues of the common law. And the Assizes of Clarendon coincided with the development of a larger bureaucratic machine that in 1177 counted more than 2,000 people. Now, this increased power of the crown overruled the vassals, of course, but also the autonomy of the church, and even the, church's power to, the church's power to elect bishops. And this had been a sore point of contention in continental Europe between the pope and the emperor, where the pope had clearly won. For the pope held the equivalent, the equivalent of a nuclear weapon in the shape of the power of excommunication. Today, excommunication has lost its edge, we could say, but in the Middle Ages, its power was extraordinary. Why? Because the structure of feudal power, we can say, was fluid. The power of the king was accepted, or we could say maybe tolerated, but enforcement of the vassalage was neither easy nor complete nor prudent. The inevitable grievances between vassals and kings may have been dormant, sometimes when expedient, but by excommunicating a king, the pope literally, by a stroke of the pen, freed all the king's vassals from their duty of allegiance, the duty to pay taxes, etc., etc. And against this claimed power of the king of England by to nominate bishops emerge a figure whose name rings familiar to some, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket. When he quarreled with the king on the issue of the bishop's investiture, Becket first fled to France. He then returned to England in 1177, but as you may recall, he was brutally murdered. And the four terrorists who murdered him in the popular imagination were compared to the knights to the night of the Apocalypse by the public relations machinery of the Vatican. Following this, the Archbishops of Seine, Seine in France, of which we see the cathedral here in France, published a ban prohibiting King Henry II to enter any church, and the bishops who had stood with the king were, of course, also excommunicated. The following year, Becket was proclaimed a saint, and Henry II thought it more expedient to seek, to seek the Pope's absolution. He was condemned, condemned to declare public penance and contrition on the tomb of Thomas Becket. The media, then as now, tried to mount a story about the event and the medieval chronicles by Giovanni Villani, we read and I translate, <coughs> this Henry II, he was the one who had St. Thomas' 
Archbishop of Canterbury murdered, for the Archbishop condemned the vices of the King, as well as depriving the Church of the tithes due to her. But God made great judgment. Shortly later, as Henry II was riding with the French King Louis in Paris, a pig trampled between the legs of the horse, the King fell and shortly later died. Which was not true. In fact, the King lived until 1189. And, and, and Beckett's murder, as you know, inspired Thomas Eliot to compose the drama Murder in the Cathedral. But now let's go back to Henry II, who, among other things, imposed a tax on all private property. And although not directly connected with the episodes that, that led to the Magna Carta, it is in this period that there begins to form in Europe, to rise at least, various ideas about the nature of kingship including, for example, the healing power of the king. And parallel to this enhancement of the king's estate as a ruler went the enhancement of the contribution that the crown imposed on the vassals. This also coincided with the extraordinary economic growth that occurred around the year 1000. The king needed funds to wage wars, and all tax requests were subject to the common law, which is a shorthand for the will of the king, common law will of the king. We can imagine how popular were the sheriffs who were in charge of tax collection. And here our story connects the event tied to the real first imperial world war, uh, Europe, excuse me, European world war, which we covered in an earlier historical sketch about the Battle of Bouvin in France between the allied forces of the German emperor and the English against the French. In that occasion, King John allied himself with the German Emperor to be to the point of actually declaring himself his vassals, according to at least to some historians. But the King of France won the Battle of Bouvin, after which King John had to face the internal mood of tax revolt by the vassals and the barons of the land. Which brings us to the general meeting at Runnymede between the towns of Windsor and Staines in, in near London, and the document that went known down into history, known as the Magna Carta. The most important deliberation of the document, as I said before, was that whenever a new tax was concocted, the king had to convene vassals and ecclesiastics in order to hold a parliament, which is the late, a late Latin word parliament, meaning a speaking, a talk. As mentioned before, the concession of the Magna Carta were immediately declared invalid, and with the next king, Henry III, the Parliament became a type of judicial assembly under total, under total king control. That is, the Parliament was not, was not what we assumed it to be today. Now, in the remaining section of this sketch, I will explore a bit more the characters and the spirit of the times when when, when these events took place. King John, by the way, is the same King John to whom Shakespeare dedicated this play by the same name. The plot surrounding the reign of, the, the reign of, of John and of his father, Henry, Henry II, are extremely complicated and any simplification is bound to be, as you can imagine, imprecise and somewhat arbitrary by definition. But that is the destiny of all histories, great and small. Besides King John and the main characters of the plot were his mother Eleanor of Aquitaine, his brother Richard the Lionheart, who preceded John as, as the king, the older brother Geoffrey of Normandy, and the son of Geoffrey of Normandy, called Arthur, who both in Shakespeare's play and according to some historians, King John had assassinated. Many names here, no need to remember. Why did he, was he assassinated? Because allegedly Richard the Lionheart, the anointed king of England, wanted Arthur, his nephew that is, and not John, his brother, to be the next king. And here is a miniature of the offspring of Eleanor of Aquitaine. One factor to consider in the very complicated saga that led to the Magna Carta and its, its prompt rejection is that the kings of England through the line of, of William the Conqueror, the kings of England were both rulers of England and of a section of France. 
and the map here shows the duchies in France with, that were ruled by the dukes belonging to the English dominion, if we want to call it that way. Some of these duchies had been acquired through marriage, and therefore the King of England was also, at one point, simultaneously a vassal of the King of France for some of these duchies. And to further complicate matters, the German King of the Romans, here of the Western Roman Empire, lay claim to the whole of Europe. And I am referring again to the historical sketch on the Battle of Bouvin, the Battle of the Summer 1214, which was the real First World War. And had not France won, there would not be the France that we know today, certainly not as a nation. Another important component to consider is that, starting in the 11th century, there was a tremendous development in technology, trade and culture, if you like, in Europe, so that quite quickly, relatively speaking, the traditional medieval instruments of government became, if you like, obsolete or certainly insufficient to deal with these developments. Therefore, we have two phenomena occurring simultaneously. From below, the creation of administrative structures to deal with the challenges, with the challenges of development, we would say today, and from above, the need to manage, to coordinate and to control, to control the various and newly sprung administrative structures, which, as we can imagine, created all sorts of difficulties and conflicts. And it was unrealistic for the King of France, or the King of England, excuse me, to rule both England and half of France, where, by the way, each of the duchies had also distinct, separate legal structures, customs, and even systems of measurements. Now, Shakespeare's play, Henry V, described Henry's success in reconquering France, while the cycle of Henry VI plays laments, laments the loss of France by Henry V's successors. One of the says, one of the characters says, all is lost, as all had never been. The character was Humphrey of Gloucester at the beginning of one of the plays. Eventually, England's hold on France was reduced to, to the city of Calais, or Calais, which they ceded in 1588. King John's father, Henry II, had married, as mentioned before, Eleanor of Aquitaine, also called the Royal Tigress, to whom, who knows, we may dedicate, may dedicate one of the next historical sketches. The rightful heir to the throne of England was Richard, Richard the Lionheart, who, however, put in his own head to participate in one of the Crusades, the Third Crusade, to be accurate. He was known as Richard the Lionheart because of his reputation as a great military leader and warrior. The Muslim called him Melek Rik and King Richard. He was also known in the Occitan or Old French langu language as Oc et No, or Yes and No, because of his, of his reputation for terseness, arrogant, or not terseness. Anyway, while he returned home from the Third Crusade, he was captured by the Duke of Austria and held in a state of illustrious prison prisoner in his castles until the ransom was paid. And while a prisoner, according to historians, he had a proper court in Germany, receiving all sorts of embassies, dignitaries and ambassadors. Why in heaven the Duke of Austria kept Richard the Lionheart prisoner? Because he accused Richard of arranging the murder of his cousin during the crusade. Moreover, Richard had personally offended his capturer by casting down his flag from the walls of Acre in Palestine. Anyway, after the ransom was paid, Richard returned to England, but was there for a short time, for he was interested in reconquering some of his possessions in France. And he died of an arrow wound, of an arrow, a wound from an arrow, in his neck while he was besieging the puny castles of Chalou Chabrol. King John's was his successor, and his first problem was, you guessed it, how to raise money to reclaim Normandy that had been lost. The kings had three main sources of income available to them, namely revenue from their personal lands, or which is called demean, money raised through their rights as a feudal lord, and revenue, of course, from taxation. 
Revenue from the royal demesne had been diminishing for a long time, and matters were not helped by Richard's sale of many royal properties in 1189, and taxation played a much smaller role in royal income than in later centuries. English kings had widespread feudal rights, which could be used to generate income, including the demesne system in which, uh, excuse me, it's called the scutage system, in which feudal military service was avoided by a cash payment to the king. The king also derived income from fines, court fees, and the sale of properties and other privileges. John intensified his efforts to maximize all possible sources of income and was described as avaricious, mis miserly, extortionate, and money-minded. John also used revenue generation as a way of exerting political control over the barons. Debts owed to the crown by the king's favorite supporters might be forgiven. Collection of those owned, owed by enemies was more stringently enforced, of course. That is, these measures were widely abused. And in many cases, the scutage, which was the alternative to military service attacks, was levied in the absence of any actual military campaign. And John exploited his rights to demand relief payments when estates and castles were inherited, sometimes charging enormous sum beyond any baron's abilities to pay. He also increased the sale of sheriff's appointments, and in 1194, with the new incumbents making back their investments through increased fines and penalties, particularly in the forests. And the legend of Robin Hood has its root in these policies. Another curious tax was levied on widows who wished to remain single and not remarry, you can imagine. Besides, John continued to sell charters for new towns, the most famous of which was Liverpool. He also introduced a tax on income and, and, and import and export duties payable directly to the crown. John was deeply suspicious of the barons, particularly those with sufficient power and wealth to potentially challenge him. Numerous barons were subjected to John's malevolence, the most infamous case which went beyond anything considered acceptable at the time was that of v William de Browse. De Browse was subjected to punitive demands for money and when he refused to pay his wife and one of his sons were imprisoned by John which resulted in their deaths. And John's suspicious jealousies meant that he re rarely, rarely enjoyed good relationships with even the leading loyalist barons. Within a few months of John's return from the Battle of Bouvin, which we already mentioned, rebel barons in the north and east of England were organizing resistance already to his rule. And John held a council in London in January 1215 to discuss potential reforms and also sponsor discussions in Oxford between his agents and the rebels during the spring of the same year. And John appears to have been playing for time until Pope Innocent III could send letters giving him explicit papal support. Letters of support from the Pope arrived in April 12, 1215, but by then the rebel barons had organized. They congregated at Northampton in May and renounced their feudal ties to John, appointing Robert Fitzwalter as their military leader. And this self-proclaimed army of God marched on London, taking the capital as well as Lincoln and Exeter in England. And once the rebels held London, they attracted the fresh wave of defectors from John's royalist faction. And John decided at that point to organize peace talks with the rebel barons. They met at Runnebead near Windsor Castle, as I said, on the 15th of June, 1215. His negotiations were conducted by the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, who the results and the results of was the charter of the proposed peace agreement, later renamed Magna Carta or Great Charter. The charter, as we said so briefly, went beyond simply addressing specific baronial complaint and formed a wider proposal for political reform, albeit one focusing on the rights of free men not serve and unfree labor. It promised the protection of church rights, protection from illegal imprisonments, access to sweet justice, 
new taxation only with baronial consent and limitations on scutage and other feudal payments. A council of 25 barons would be created to monitor and ensure futures, uh, John's future adherence to the Charter, whilst the rebel army would stand down and London would be surrendered to the king. Neither John nor the rebel barons seriously attempted to implement this peace accord. The rebel barons su suspected, suspected that the proposed baronial council would be unacceptable to John and that he would challenge the legality of the Charter, which, which he did. And they packed the baronial council with their own hardliners and refused to demobilize their forces or surrender London as agreed. Notwithstanding an earlier excommunication, John appealed to Innocent for help, observing that the Charter compromised the Pope's right under the 1213 agreement that had appointed him John's feudal lord. Innocent declared the Magna Carta not only shameful and demeaning, but illegal and unjust, and ex excommunicated the rebel barons. The failure of the agreement led to the First Barons' War. John, John died of, uh, of stomach disease while fighting the rebels in the north of England at Newark Castle, and Shakespeare has him say, there is so hot a summer in my bosom that all my bowels crumble up with dust. And he was buried in the Cathedral of Worcester. His successor was Henry III. As usual, historical judgments on King John vary with the times. Much of John's negative reputation was established by two chronicles writing after the king's death. Historians were generally favorably in the 16th century towards the king, focusing more on John's opposition to the papacy and making him a kind of Protestant hero. During Victorian times, King John's failure were attributed to his almost superhuman wickedness, while Winston Churchill, with the typical coldness that characterizes just about everything he did, said, he said, when the long tally is added, it will be seen that the British nation and the English-speaking world owe far more to the vices of John than to the labors of his virtues sovereign, of virtuous sovereigns. Thank you for watching. Thank the crew and our director, Cat Iverson. Until next time, I am Jimmy Moldia for Historical Sketches. Thank you.